Let's just jump right in. We've been talking for the last couple of weeks about being generous. In our first week, uh, first week of May, we talked about how God is a God who is generous. This is who God is. He gave his only son, you know, the, the, the famous verse in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He is so loving that he gives. He gives. He's generous. He's got so much to give. And in giving his son Jesus, he gave the very, very best that he has for us. He didn't say, uh, all right, see all those people down on the earth. We'll give them the second best son. Or we'll give them the third or the fourth or the fifth. He didn't, he didn't give us the second. He gave us the first. He gave us the best. He gave his son Jesus, his only son, the only one that he had. He didn't send some angel out to save us. He didn't send some uh, animal or anything like that. No, he gave his only son. He gave us his very, very best. And that's who he is. That's his heart. And the, the God that we love and that we serve is a faithful God. He's generous to us. And he's not only a God or the God, but he calls himself our Heavenly Father. And if he's our Heavenly Father, that means that we're his kids. That means we're his sons and his daughters. And every good father gives good things to their kids. So he's a very, very generous God for us as well. Last week, we talked about the resources that God has. We talked about the story in Genesis 26 when Isaac faced a famine in his life. There was a literal famine. And during those days, most people were farmers. Isaac had flocks. He had sheep and cattle. He probably uh, sowed uh, seeds and he received a harvest. But it says during that famine, it says he planted a seed and he was obedient to God but he said in the middle of the famine, he received 100 fold back. He was obedient to God. And in the middle of a hard time, a difficult time, when it's tempting to just protect everything and say, oh, I'll wait till next year to, 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 to sow my seeds. I'll wait until the rains come or I'll wait until it's better, better season. No, he doesn't do that. He sowed in a famine and he reaped. 100 times back. So if he sowed one seed, he received 100 back. If he sowed 100 seeds, he received 10,000 back. For every seed that he put in the ground, he received 100 times what he sowed in the middle of a famine. It was a miracle. And so we see the pattern that God is a good God. He's our father. He's faithful. And when we sow, he provides miraculously for us. This is who God is. This is who God is. Today, we're going to continue talking about being generous. And in the season that we're in, our desire is for you to be a person who is generous. Not just in terms of bringing our tithes and offerings to the church. Yeah, that's important. It's talked about a lot in the Bible. And we preach about that. We teach about that because it's a vital, important thing to honor God with our finances. But it's not just our finances where we can be generous. It's not just bringing our tithes every, every week or every month. It's not just being generous with our offerings and giving. It's not just about that. But it's having a lifestyle of being generous where you're generous with your time. You're generous with your strength. You're generous with the wisdom and the knowledge that God has given to you because every gift that God has given you, he's given it to you for a purpose. He's given it to you for a purpose because there is a calling on your life. And God doesn't want us just to protect what we have so that we're afraid and we live a life where we're afraid of losing what we have. That's not what God wants us to do. God does not want you to be afraid of losing what you have. That's living a poverty mindset where you're always afraid of something. 
You're afraid of, oh, if I spend my money here, I'm not going to have money for this. God doesn't want you to live a life where you're always afraid of losing something. You're always thinking about what you don't have after you spend your money. No, God wants us to be generous with what we have because he's a good God. And when we're generous and when we share what we have, when we give what we have, when we sow what we have, there's always a harvest. Amen? So I want to read a few verses in the Bible. And the, the title of this message today is Lift Up Your Eyes. Lift up your eyes. It's talking about generosity, but it's, 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 it's about lifting up your eyes. Several times in the Bible, we see this phrase, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. One of the first times that we see it is when Abraham, it's uh, in, in, in Genesis. I think it's Genesis chapter 15. When Abraham sees all of the land that is before him, God brings him to a spot and says, lift up your eyes. Look north, south, east, west, every direction. Lift up your eyes and look around. All the land that you see, this is, what, this is God's words to Abraham. All the land that you see is going to be yours and your descendants, and your descendants will fill this land. This was God's promise. At that time, it was just Abraham and Sarah and his small family. Okay, Isaac hadn't even been born yet. And so God says to him, look around. Lift up your eyes. Now, the phrase lift up your eyes has the idea of not looking down at your surroundings and your circumstances. But it's getting your eyes up off of the situation that's around you and lifting up your eyes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of faith where you're saying, okay, lift up your eyes. My eyes are down here. I see my situation all around how hard it is, how difficult it is, God says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Look with vision. Look with destiny. Take a look with faith because God has something greater than just simply what's around you. And then the next time we see it is in, Deut one of the next times we see it is in Deuteronomy chapter 4. God takes Moses to the top of a mountain and God says to Moses, Lift up your eyes. Now, Moses was not going to go into the promised land, but God wanted to show him. God wanted to show him this is the land that the people of Israel are going to live in. So God takes him to the top of a mountain. And God says, lift up your eyes. Look, very similar to Abraham. Look, north, south, east, west, all this land that you see. Look across the valley into the land. All this land that you see is going to be the land of Israel. It's going to be the new nation of Israel. God says, lift up your eyes. Don't concern yourself with the things of every day and the situation. No, look with vision. This is the future. Lift up your eyes. We see this verse again. We see the same phrase again in Psalms 121. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Once again, it's that situation where things look so terrible, so great all around me, but I'm going to lift up my eyes. I'm going to lift up my eyes. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? The help for my situation right here is above the hills. The situation that I'm facing is right here, right in front of me, right now. But my help is bigger than the hills. My help comes from the maker of the hills, the maker of heaven and earth. He is the one who's going to help me. So I will lift up my eyes. Now, the verse that I want to focus on right here is in John chapter 4, verse 35. In John chapter 4, we read the story, and we did this a, a number of weeks ago. We talked about this story a number of weeks ago. Um, it's a story of the Samaritan woman at the well. When Jesus went through Samaria, stopped at the well, the disciples went into the town, 
to buy some food, but Jesus was relaxing beside the well, and the Samaritan woman came out. The Samaritan woman came out, was chatting with Jesus. They started talking about water. Jesus said, can you get me some water? And uh, they had a big, big conversation, started talking about living water, true water. And Jesus said to her, I am the living water. I am the source of living water. And then they continue having a conversation. It shifts from, you know, from water to religion to, you know, they even talked about her own personal life. Jesus saw prophetically uh, her situation, her life. And what happened is Jesus spoke into her heart and brought a change into her heart and brought a change into her life and revealed himself as the Messiah to this woman. And then she was just amazed. She said, man, look at what Jesus knew about me. He's revealed to me everything about myself. He knew everything about me. And so she went back into the village to tell people about Jesus. She said, come and see Jesus. And so she went into the village while the disciples were in there, and then they ended up coming back. The disciples came back before the woman did, and they were chatting with Jesus and uh, brought him some food and stuff. But the woman had gone into the village and said, this is Jesus. This is, come see this man. He told me everything about my life. He told me that he is the Messiah. He told me all about, you know, true religion and true worship. Worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And she said, come and see. And so she came back and she led all of the people in the village outside of the village back to this well to see Jesus. So in the meantime, Jesus was still sitting at the well. His disciples had come back. They were chit-chatting with Jesus a little bit. And when that woman came back, she was leading all the people from the village back to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. The same phrase where we're lifting up our eyes from our situation and from our surroundings, focusing on the Lord, focusing in faith in the future and the destiny and the calling. Jesus says that to his disciples. Lift up your eyes. Don't be so worried about food. Don't be so worried about what you're going to eat. And don't be so worried about water. And don't even be so worried about Samaritans and different people, women and men and all of those things that were barriers to them speaking about the kingdom of God to people. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. And as he said that, Everybody was coming back to meet Jesus. He said, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. He said, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they, are ready, for they are already white for harvest. Some scholars believe that when all of these people were coming out from the town, they, were, they would be dressed in, ro in white robes and probably have white turbans or white hats on. And Jesus said, look, the fields are white. It was a, a harvest coming to the disciples, coming to Jesus, coming to hear Jesus. And Jesus said, lift up your eyes. The harvest is ready. The harvest is already ready. It's not four months away. You don't have to wait until a certain season. You don't have to wait until a certain thing happens. No, the harvest is ready. You just need to lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and see who's coming. Lift up your eyes and see who is ready. Lift up your eyes. And that's what I believe is God's encouragement for us today. The harvest is all around you. The harvest is right near you. Lift up your eyes. Who has God placed in your, in your sphere, in your, in your surroundings, all around you? Who has God put in your life that is ready for the harvest? It's not four months away. It's right now. 
Jesus said, don't wait. The harvest is coming. The harvest is ready. It's already white. It's already ready to be brought in. Look, lift up your eyes. Look around you. See who's around you. Who can you speak to about the kingdom of God, about the wonderful things that God has done, about the truth of God? Lift up your eyes. If the fields are ready and white for harvest, what does that mean? Number one, the harvest never brings itself in. The harvest cannot bring itself in. When was the last time you went out to cut down the rice and, oh, it already came in already all by itself? No, it doesn't do that. It needs people to go out and harvest the rice, harvest the wheat, harvest the grain. Okay, if you have a tree that's full of fruit, it doesn't just, you know, jump into the basket all by itself. It doesn't roll into the house by itself. No, you got to go and you got to pick it and you got to bring in the harvest. And so even spiritually, the harvest doesn't come in all by itself. The workers have to go out into the fields, cut down the harvest, and bring it all in. So God needs workers. God needs you. God needs you because there are people in your life that you have influence over that nobody else does. There are people in your life that God has placed in your life for a reason. He's placed you in their lives for a reason. Because only you can be the person who brings that harvest in. People are ready. Their hearts are open. Their hearts are open. When we have difficult situations in our lives, people's hearts start to get soft. It's the, it's the times when things are good and we say, oh, I don't need God. I, 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 I can do things on myself. I, people are full of pride and selfishness. But when things get difficult, they start looking around for an answer. Where's the answer? Where's the hope? Where's the life? You have the answer. You have the answer. Jesus is our living hope. He's the way, the truth, the life. That's what people are looking for. And you have it. You need to go. And you need to be the one who brings in the harvest. Listen to this verse in John chapter 16, verse 8. I love this verse. John chapter 16, it's when Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he, he's talking about when he leaves and sends the Holy Spirit to come. He said, I have to leave because if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. And so he's just preparing them. This is all, everything that happens before Jesus went to the cross. But this is the verse, what, he, what Jesus says. Let's read from verse 5. We'll read 5, 6, 7, and probably all the way till 9. So it says, verse 5 says, But now I go away to him who sent me. So meaning that Jesus is meaning that he's going to go back up to heaven. But none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the helper meaning the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I depart, I will send him to you. And listen, this is the verse that I wanted us to read. Uh, verse 8. And when he has come... He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And verse 9 and 10 explain that a little bit more. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So Jesus is saying the Spirit of God is working. And as Christians, we talk a lot about the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit, have the fruit of the Spirit. And we know from experience how the Spirit works in our own heart. 
Maybe it's, maybe it's times you're tempted to do something, the Holy Spirit brings conviction, turns you to the right direction. Or maybe this happens, or maybe you're led by the Spirit to say something to someone, and, this, the, and God uses you in a great way to bring change into somebody's life. We know how the Spirit works. But the same Spirit that works in us is even working in people, the Bible says, who don't believe. It convicts people of sin because they don't believe. And so we have to have faith when we're talking to people and when we're evangelizing, when we're being a light to people and being generous to people. We have to have faith that the Spirit of God is also doing something in them as well. Don't just think, oh yeah, it's just empty words or, oh, I hope this happens. You don't know. Be confident in the Spirit of God. Be confident in what the Spirit can and will do in the hearts of other people. Because that same spirit that's telling you, go and speak to that person, is the same person, is the same spirit that's working in that person saying, yes, this is truth. Yes, this is truth. Respond to it. So the spirit is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you, but it's also speaking through them as well. The next point is workers need to go out and bring the harvest in. I'm going to read a passage in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 to 13. And I just want you to listen to this, but it's got some principles that I want to bring out as we're thinking about being a light and being bold to speak to other people about Jesus. Okay? So in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was sending his disciples out, and he's giving them these instructions. Listen to what it says. Jesus sent the twelve out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received... Freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. In whatever city or town you enter, inquire in that city who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. Or sorry, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. So Jesus sent out his disciples and said, okay, I want you to go. And he's, you know, in other passages we see, he sent them out two by two. Two go here, two go here, two go there, go to this town, go to that town. But he's saying, as you go, do these, do these things. Preach the kingdom of heaven. Do miracles. Pray for people. Okay? And do all of these things. And I think it's all principles that we can use as we are bold and as we are confident to talk to other people about God as well. Number one, go to the lost sheep. This is how Jesus sees everybody. He sees them as lost sheep. He wants to bring them to him. He wants to make them a part of his flock. He wants to add them into his flock. Remember the story of the good shepherd who went out to find the lost sheep. When he brought him in, there was rejoicing. All right, we got the lost sheep back. He's back. This is the heart that Jesus has towards those people that are all around you. Lift up your eyes. Look at them. They are lost sheep. They are lost sheep. Speak to them about the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we hear people say, there's a saying that kind of goes around, that sometimes people use this. They say, preach the gospel wherever you go, and if necessary, use words. Meaning that in everything that we do, we should be preaching the gospel through our actions and our good character and kindness and love to everybody. But I don't think that's enough. I don't think it's enough just to be a good person. There's plenty of good people out in the world. There's lots of good people. 
but they don't have the source of life. They don't have hope. They don't have what can change a person's heart, but we do. So being a good example is good, but it's not enough. Jesus told his disciples, when you go out, speak to them, preach to them about the kingdom of heaven. Preach to people about the hope that you have in a hopeless situation. Preach to them about, speak to them about the love that you've experienced in the presence of God. Each and every Sunday, when you're at home, in your difficult situation, you have love. You have the, the presence of God, a faithful father with you. Speak to them about that. Don't just live it, but speak to them about that. Communicate that to them. Next one, Jesus told them to heal the sick. Be bold. Have faith. Pray for people. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. Prayer can change that person's situation. Believe. Pray in faith. They would see healing. They would see miracles, deliverance. Hearts changed. Marriages restored. Relationships brought back together. Pray and do it and see miracles take place as you do it. This is one thing we need to think about as we're generous as well. Don't worry about the provision. Jesus said to his disciples, don't take gold and silver and coins and all that sort of stuff. Don't worry about all that stuff. But just go. Be faithful. Follow the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think that if I'm generous with what I have, I'm going to lose something. I'm going to lose something. That's fear of losing. Okay? But someone who is generous knows that as we sow, they're going to receive something back. A farmer sows knowing in faith that there's going to be a harvest. And he might see that seed go down under the ground and not see it again, but when he sees it again, it's going to turn into a, a, a harvest for him. And so as you go, don't worry about provision. As you're generous, don't worry, don't fear losing something, but so in faith with anticipation for the harvest as well. And the last one from Jesus' examples here, be a person of peace and give, bring peace wherever you go. Jesus said, let your peace settle on that house, but if it doesn't, let the peace come back on you. So basically what he's saying there, be a person that brings peace. Bring blessing, bring hope and joy. Bring peace to people's lives. But if they don't receive it, God says, don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. Have peace. Let that peace come back to you. So God's in charge of making the things grow. When we plant the seed, the farmer isn't the one who says, seed, grow, and it grows. No, the farmer is not in charge. He just puts the seed in, and, you know, the miracle of seeds and soil and ground and all that makes it grow. God's in charge of all that. So when we sow with our time and with our effort, even with our finances, or maybe God's telling you, bake a you know, make a, a, a dinner for somebody. Bring them dinner one night as a blessing to them and to their family. Maybe that's, that's the seed that you're sowing. God will make it grow. And if it doesn't, if they reject you, that's okay. Let God's peace return to you because you are faithful to do what he's asked you to do. You are faithful to sow the seeds. Lift up your eyes. Think, who is around you right now? The last point I want to make is from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Just listen to this verse. It says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. So this verse is basically saying, Sometimes 
when you're looking around and you look up at the sky, oh, it's too windy. I can't sow my seeds right now because it's too windy. Or it's not rainy enough. There's not enough ground. There's not, there's not enough water in the ground. This verse says, if you wait for the perfect time to sow the seeds, you're never going to sow because the perfect time never comes. There's always a better time. So basically it's saying the perfect time will never come, so sow seeds right now. This is the time to do it. So God's encouragement to you is be someone who goes, looks around, speaks to people about the truth of the word of God, and bring that harvest in. Lift up your eyes. Look in faith. Let the Spirit of God be a prophetic spirit inside of you that looks to the future and says, what if, what if I speak to one person a day about the kingdom of God? What if I say to one person a day, share my testimony with them. God saved me. I used to be like this. Now I'm like this. You need hope in your life. I have hope. I know the source of hope. What if we did this one person a day or one person a week? How would that change? What would the future, what would your future look like? Be filled with people who have come into the kingdom of God because of you. Because you looked up, you lifted up your eyes and say, I'm going to bring that harvest in. God needs you. God needs you. The kingdom of God needs you. People around you need you to share with them about God. They need the kingdom of God. They need hope. They need love. They need life. And you have it. I want to encourage you. Look up. Lift up your eyes in faith. Look, lift up your eyes to the people who are around you. And God will lead you into the future that he has. Let's pray together. As we pray, I want us to ask the Holy Spirit for the names of someone that you know. Ask him for the name of someone that you know that he wants you to speak to. Because the, I believe that all of us have people around us. All of us have people around us who, are, who, are, who, are, who, who need hope in the kingdom of God. And so as we pray, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you about those people. But if he doesn't, if, he does, if you don't get a specific word, I still want you to have boldness. Because this is not something where we just have to sit and wait. But it's something where the Holy Spirit is telling us, no, now, now's the time. There are people around you. Maybe you don't even know them yet. Maybe you don't even know who they are. Okay? Where the Holy Spirit may speak to you, but even if he doesn't, have faith. Have faith and say, no, this is what God has called me to do. I'm going to do it. So let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you use us. It's actually kind of humbling that you do because who are we? But we thank you for using us, for working in us, for for speaking to us, for using us in the lives of other people. And God, first of all, we want to say, God, that we make ourselves available. If you're out there and you're, you agree with this prayer, I want to encourage you. Say, that, say to God, God, I make myself available. I make myself available to be used by you. Here I am. Just say those words to God right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to me the names of people who you want me to speak to this week or next week. 
or the week after. Holy Spirit, I want to be a part of that harvest. I want to be a part of that harvest. I want to be a part of that joy when the harvest is brought in. I want to be part of that celebration when that lost sheep is found. I want to be part of that. So Holy Spirit, I make myself available to you. Use me. Speak to me. Speak through me. For the sake of your kingdom. For the glory of your name, that you would be famous in this land. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you that you have chosen us to be a part of your kingdom. And as we partner together, let us see your kingdom extended to the ends of the earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.